Thank you, Scott. I'm going to uh, bring out one of our robots here. That's going to be helpful to describe what we're doing here. No. There we go. Excuse me. Okay, so, so I started this company. I'm one of the founders. We started a few years back. Uh, the other people were very talented uh, robotics folks from iRobot. And we had a very ambitious goal when we started the company. And that was, we didn't have any idea what industry we were going to focus on or what the specific technology might be. What we were interested in doing was solving critical business issues with robotics. So pushing the field of robotics at the same time as we solved very significant business issues. And we ended up after long, long story of how we got to agriculture, but I'll start by describing a little bit what I learned about agriculture along the way. Uh, so if you're like me, uh, I thought agriculture 100 years ago looked like this on the left, now it looks like on the right, and 95% of the labor must be wrung out of agriculture, which it turns out that is far from true. Uh, there are lots of crops like those on the left here, which I think are peppers or, or strawberries perhaps, that uh, 100 years ago it looked like that, and today it looks like this. So, and it is far from only a 5% issue. It is a huge business problem in agriculture, which uh, is $150 billion worth of crops a year that are produced. So I'll jump right into... Uh, where we ended up within the sector of ag is the production of these kinds of plants that you might buy at your local uh, nursery, uh, garden center for your garden, or landscapers purchase this kind of stuff. It turns out this is 10% of all agricultural production is just this sector of crops. It takes 250,000 people uh, to support this industry, to produce all these crops, and 65,000 people just to move these plants around every day to produce them. So we saw that opportunity and said, aha, there we must be able to build a robot that can move plants around. It's far easier than our Eduardo trying to pick up cups and Colum trying to do all that sophisticated stuff. Uh, so away we went. Um, here is a quick video of what it looks like in the industry today. This is actually a local Massachusetts grower that field is 40 feet wide and 1,200 feet long, and all of those plants get there by people like that, uh, just walking back and forth, carrying 30 to 50 pounds at a time, and that's what they do for a living. So it's not a big surprise that there aren't very many people who enjoy doing that kind of work. And in fact, our customers in the industry tell us they've gotten to the point where it's completely unsustainable. There just aren't the workers to do that. It uh, causes huge problems for them, and they take risks. So fast forward to today. What did we come up with? Uh, this is one of our customers in Georgia. This field is 100 feet wide and 600 feet long. The, these plants are put here in the fall for winter storage, and then they usually send out an army of workers to walk back and forth and arrange them in these nice patterns here. Uh, but instead, we have our robots doing that task. So these are fully autonomous machines, very simple programming. Uh, by This is Hector in the yellow shirt. It took him all of probably 20 minutes to be trained on how to use the robots. And uh, he can set them up. He does a little bit of adjusting in the beginning of the day. But then they will work for hours and hours doing this very repetitive job and spacing all these plants. There are these, these yellow lines are part of our system, so you do need workers to do certain parts of the job. Uh, you don't want to, it, it's not necessary to automate everything. It's only necessary to automate the pieces of the job that are really hard for the workers to do. They're perfectly happy to string the tapes out and set up the robots, but it's all the heavy lifting of moving these plants around. So this is going on in every state 
uh, well, maybe not Alaska, but uh, in almost every state in the United States has these kind of production facilities. So it's not your local garden center. This business sells to Lowe's and Home Depot. So big, big uh, multi-million dollar businesses that have a, a critical labor issue that we're solving. And these robots, uh, this video actually is about uh, four hours long. So these guys over that time period moved approximately 50,000 pounds worth of plants. And two workers could have done that work, but they would have certainly been extremely exhausted at the end of the day. Plus, we do it, oh, he's a little lost. Uh, plus the, uh, plus the uh, consistency and accuracy the, of the way the machines can do it is far better. Uh, so that's the problem we're solving in the industry. As, as Scott just mentioned, we just started shipping product. We started the company, got our first fundraising uh, just about three years ago, and we started shipping product in September, which is exciting and very scary because we're not really ready. Uh, but we're learning a lot, and our customers are just completely ecstatic about the, uh, the robots. So if we can cut to the mind probe. Uh, so this is a small demonstration. This is what the robot is seeing here. So there's, there's a suite of very advanced sensors here uh, uh, in the robot. Those feed into the robot's brain uh, and give it a sense of perception and reasoning and then how to act. How does it navigate? How does it move around? So what it's looking for is plants. And my legs look sufficiently like plants <laughs> that it's seeing me here, it's seeing the wall behind, and uh, it needs all of this perception and reasoning because for it to do its work, it's not in a nice climate controlled environment like we have here, it's out in the real world where it has to work from full sun to full dark, uh, in the rain, uneven conditions, in the mud, all kinds of things. So you need a very sophisticated platform, but you have to keep it extremely simple for the workers to be able to use it. So thank you for coming out. This is uh, Shaq, is the name of this robot, and thanks for coming out to meet Shaq tonight. All right, yeah, we were waiting for the robot to grab one of your legs and wrestle you to the ground. Yeah, sometimes that happens. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, um, Okay, I was driving out, I guess it was this summer, to some godforsaken part of Connecticut uh, to see, oh yeah, we should pull the... Uh, yeah, so that's the stop. Yeah, uh, the ripcord there. Yeah. So I was driving out to a farm uh, or a nursery in Connecticut to see the exactly. robots at work this summer uh, and write about harvest. And as I was driving from Boston, it started to rain. And I was like, oh, geez, you know. I bet the robots are not going to be never working today. Work we picked rain. a bad day. You know, I'm going to have driven an hour and a half or whatever it was to Connecticut to just talk to Charlie and look at the robots sitting in a shed somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, but then once I got there, they were hard at work. There was no roof covering the area they were working. So what exactly. are the what are the environmental parameters that they can work in? So they need to. We chose this industry specifically because it's not completely random what's out in the environment. They need a certain level of flatness of the terrain um, in order to grow the plants properly. So that helps a lot, but still you have, on that day that you came, it was raining. There's mud that's coming up through what they call the ground cloth that the plants are sitting on. So th there are a lot of things that it has to deal with. We don't deal with unlimited uh, variety of terrain, but, and the environment is also changing as the robot is working, so it has to be pretty smart. And you said, like though, that. that they'll work in a driving rain, basically, where the, ordin the human farm workers would be like, I'm going to go into the shed and hang out and wait for it to stop right. raining. Right. Well, actually, the, the agreement we made with our customers early on was, we'll build robots that will work in any environment you might send people out into. So no hurricanes, no, you know, as you say, driving rain. Uh, our robots, in order to get something out to the market quickly, uh -huh. which is extremely important, you've got to set limits on yourself. So but we can work in, you know, rain, but, and we don't have to work in the not snow to, or the ice or, exactly. Yeah. Um, but so you did build this very rugged robot 
uh, you know, that can deal with all kinds of changing environments and obstacles and doesn't bump into human beings that are working around it. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing that when you raised all this money from investors, you had some ideas about, hey, here are some other areas other than commercial nurseries where this kind of robot might be yeah, useful. absolutely. Are they absolutely. all agricultural, kind of all of the possibilities you think about? Well, there are a lot of agricultural, so there are multiple products for this nursery and greenhouse industry, not mm -hmm. just moving the plants around, but applying pesticides and herbicides and trimming them and things like that. So uh -huh. there's, there's a product roadmap that sort of goes uh, up the uh, nursery and greenhouse track. We're currently looking at other agricultural crops like wheat and corn, some of these big huge crops that right now there's giant machines to do the harvesting, uh, do the planting and the harvesting, so sort of the beginning and the end, but they don't have any way to get in and gather data about their crops as they're growing. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're working with a few people to look into that as a possibility as well. So agriculture is big and we have ideas for mining and construction and warehousing and basically material handling applications. And what, I mean, I'm naturally thinking about like, you know, trimming the hedges at my house and things like that, but yeah. so what's the current yeah. cost of, um, of one of the harvest automation bots, roughly? Uh, the they're up for discussion right uh -huh. now. We had a, I had a long discussion with uh, my board of directors this morning on this topic. Oh, yeah? Right now we're selling them for $30,000 each. Uh -huh. and, and your board thinks that's way too low. Way too Give low, away. way too low. <laughs> Um, and that gives our customers a payback on the equipment of anywhere between about 15 and 30 months, uh -huh. which is pretty attractive for them. They're used to buying equipment that takes much longer than that to pay back. So. And I want to talk about, you know, just because I find that, you know, when I went to this nursery in Connecticut, you guys were there kind of doing a demo and showing the nursery owner what the bots mm -hmm. could do. And I think there were maybe two bots working at the time. Yep. Um, but then all around, there were human nursery workers that these guys employ to move plants around and fertilize and water and things like that. And I'm guessing that they must be very curious about the future of their jobs when they see you show up and unload your bots from, you know, the back of your yep. pickup truck. Yep, curious is one way of putting it. Uh -huh. yeah. So what um, kind of reaction do you get? I mean, because clearly this is something where the nursery owner thinks, gee, I can deal with the uncertainties of employing maybe mm -hmm. legal, maybe illegal people in my operation yep. uh, so, with a robot. Right, so, and to sort of extend that, it's not just the workers there, but I get this question asked all the time. Aren't you taking jobs away from people who, and the reality is we're solving a huge problem because there really are no workers who will do this kind of work uh, at this point. Uh, most of them are undocumented. Businesses are taking big risks to do that. Uh -huh. uh, so we're really solving an unsustainable problem. Right. You're saying for there are no the legal industry. workers who you can hire to do this kind and of And even the undocumented workers, there are fewer and fewer of them in this country. They're, they're, just, they're being squeezed out uh, by just demographics and trends. And mm -hmm. they come here to this country, and their kids wouldn't do this kind of work that they're mm -hmm. doing. So it's sort of a dying breed, people who would do this kind of work. Mm -hmm. So the workers that are there today, though, I also, I did have the fear that, oh, our robots are going to frequently end up under the pickup truck, you know, uh -huh. by accident. <laughs> under the moving right? truck. Um, yeah. But it turns out it is not that way at all, that they don't like doing the work. They're happy to supervise the robots mm -hmm. doing the labor, but they and, really don't. And explain uh, what supervising the robots involves. I remember when I was yep. there, there's someone with like a wet nap basically that would occasionally like clean off the sensors yep. if they got too muddy or dusty, right? So yep. the robot could see where it was. Yep, so we're working That's on being a little. Like, the yeah, wet nap exactly, job. exactly. Um, we're working on uh, having less of that in the robot, but the main job is to set up the robots, put the there's this yellow tape that goes down the side of the field. Mm -hmm. Put the parameters, there's a very simple user interface on the back here, they mm -hmm. put in six or so parameters. And then um, also an agreement with our customers up front was for us to get a, a reasonably cost product to market quickly, the robot doesn't have to be 100% perfect. Mm -hmm. It can be 95 or 98% perfect, and every once in a while it might tip over a plant or it might miss, and that's okay for us to just do 95% of the work. So it allowed us to go much faster to get a product to market. So the supervisor does a little bit of the cleanup as well when the yeah. robot messes up. Uh, 
And uh, I'm guessing humans mess up sometimes too. They probably exactly. knock over plants. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Pretty often. But but I think you told me that the speed, at least when I saw it this summer, is it's not as fast because it's carrying one plant at a time. Humans are typically carrying two. So you, you're mm -hmm. not as fast as human workers are yet. Um, so the plants we were moving that day were three gallon containers and you're right. People mm -hmm. carry two, we only carry one. If you average it over a you would think, oh, they're only going to work, be half as productive. But if you average it over the course of a day and all the breaks that the human workers have to take and they go to lunch and they do this and that, we're very close to being on par for one robot can do the work of one person. And is that you over a 24-hour day where you've got the robots no. working through the night? Or? No. Some of our customers are going to use you know, more than one shift. But, uh -huh. uh, it's it, the way they describe it. It's pretty easy to get a, a robot supervisor to stay an extra couple hours a day. Whereas, when you get to the end of an eight-hour shift and you're the human labor moving 50 pounds, uh, two or three hundred times an hour, you know those guys are are done after eight hours. So, and did you think when you started the company? This is my last question for you. Do you think when you started the company that this was the application area you're going to wind up with, or where when you started Q Robotics? Right. Four or five years right. ago, were you just saying we want to do some cool robots and find a business for it? Or yeah, we actually uh, Joe Jones, who is our CTO and one of my co-founders, he's he's very well known in the industry, and he really inspired us to say that um, there were more successful robots out there if one knew where to look. So we looked for where there was a lot of labor and big business issues, and we actually came up with 15 different product ideas after a couple of months. But agriculture quickly distinguished itself as being a big, big business problem mm -hmm. and something we could get a product onto the market relatively quickly. Mm -hmm. And so where that's how we focused in on. And it. I noticed there are some other startup companies that are trying to get into that market, like there's so someone working on an orange picking robot. And oh, they been, they started five years before us. Uh -huh. They're still working on it. Yeah, that's yep. a much slower. I'm just I'm a Floridian originally, so I'm very interested in orange picking. Yeah. So we think actually we are going to pick oranges someday sooner than those folks are. Oh, but we'll right have. On the gauntlet here. That's it. That's it. But we'll have a dozen successful products in an evolution that'll gradually work up the capabilities to picking oranges. All right. I'm gonna That's hold you. I'm gonna hold you to that. I want the okay. first glass of orange juice picked by robots. It's a deal. All right, thank you, Charlie. Yeah, thank you, Scott.